old adage, seeing is believing. Not the way that God wants his children to live, but there is something to be said about it. When Israel's leader, Moses, went up on Mount Sinai to meet with God and to receive there from him instructions about how to build a tabernacle for their worship so that God might live among them, the people down below became impatient. And after about 40 days of seeing nothing and hearing nothing, they decided in a sense that they would move on by commissioning the creation of an idol that they would then call their God. Every day of not laying eyes on their leader and every day of not experiencing the mighty arm of God that they had become accustomed to in their miraculous deliverance from slavery had put Israel one step closer to unbelief, which led to idolatry, which then in turn led to widespread immorality. And it's the aftermath of this idol worship theme that provides the backdrop for our text this morning in Exodus 33. The people have sinned by worshiping a false god, and God has judged them. 3,000 of them were put to death by the sword. And then he sent a plague among them, which is a sad turn of events when you really think it through, because God used plagues to afflict the Egyptians. God used plagues to inspire the Egyptians to release his people from their slavery. And God had told his people early in their wilderness wandering, remember back at Marah where they were grumbling with him because there was a lack of water there. God said, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will not put any of the diseases on you, put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, the healer. They had not listened, and they had not obeyed. They had not heeded or kept God's statutes. The acts of judgment designed to liberate Israel have now been rightly incurred by Israel. The healer, has become the one who afflicts, and it leaves everyone wondering who is on the Lord's side, or perhaps more importantly, whose side is the Lord on? And that's where we pick up this morning. It's in the midst of this confusion, this unsettledness of of who stands where in this relationship with God. We are figuratively sorting through the rubble. We are feeling the aftershocks in this text. We are assessing the damage of Israel's seismic failure that had shaken the foundations of life as they knew it. Something very serious, something life-altering has happened between God and Israel. And change is in the air. The first change we encounter in the text is a change of setting. The Lord said to Moses, verse 1, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you've brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. Basically, it's moving day. It's time to leave the scene of the crime behind. It's time to press on. God still intends for Israel to inherit the promised land. That's a good sign. Although the language God uses indicates it might not be as good as it seems. Because in Exodus 6-7, and in other places as well, but in Exodus 6-7, God speaks of Israel as my people. But if you read this carefully, you note know he talks of them here as the people. Language is subtle. It's important to listen well. It's important to, to read well. This little distinction between my people and the people, it's sort of akin to my son who wins some award for something and the boy who needs to be bailed out of jail. God's word hint at a developing distance between himself 
and Israel, something that's confirmed by the next change, change of plans. Israel might be going to the promised land, but God is not. God says, I'll send up an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. We know this is a change of plan. Because back in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, God's telling Moses his intention for Israel. And in that discourse, he says, I know their sufferings. I, I've heard what they're up against. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out. Out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land. I have come down to deliver them out and to bring them up. It was God's intention to bring the people out of Egypt into the promised land himself. But here in verse 2 of chapter 33, things have changed. There's a whole new tour guide has been inserted. The Israelites can still have the land because God is a God of his word. God will keep his covenant. Even though they had broken the covenant, God will keep his end of the bargain. So they can still have the land, but now an angel is going to have to lead them to it, not God. He says, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you. God says, here, I'm out. I'm done. In his commentary, Phil Riken has a good line. He says, they were still booked for the promised land, but God has canceled his reservations. I will not go with you, God says. And then he tells them why. I won't go with you lest I consume you on the way. Now, we have to read this rightly. We have to be careful here, I think, because we probably all have people in our lives who grate on our last nerve. And the thought of going on a trip with that person that you just thought of is dreadful, right? We might say something like, I can't spend five hours in a car with him. I'll kill him. And then we might read that, okay, this is what God is saying. I can't spend a few minutes with you people. I'll kill you. But that's not what God is saying. God is not saying that these people might irritate him just randomly at some point uh, so, the, so that he would reduce them to powder in a bad spell. Because God's not like us, right? God, doesn't, God is not at risk of losing his temper like we are. God is not at risk of the temporary insanity that we sometimes experience. What he's saying is that these people are so rebellious, they are so offensive, so sinful, that they very well will just do something that he would, because he's a God of justice, have to exact immediate judgment or justice upon them. He's holy, is what he's saying, and they're not. When what is holy comes into contact with what is unholy, the consequences for the unholy thing not good. So a question that sort of circulates throughout this whole text is how does a holy God live with a sinful people? God says here he won't. I won't go. I won't go because I might consume you. I might destroy you because you are a stiff-necked people. What do we know about stiff necks other than that age-old thing? You wake up and, oh, when you hear that phrase, stiff neck, what do you think of? What do you think God is saying about that? A stubborn? Anybody else? Won't change? So they're obstinate, they're resistant. The imagery sort of escapes us unless you grew up on a farm, and most of us, I'm guessing, did not. The imagery is of a farm animal that won't submit to the farmer. Whether he's resisting the yoke, won't even allow it to be put on him, or ignoring the prods from the farmer's gold, the, 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 the stick with the pointy thing on the end of it that the farmer uses to direct the oxen left or right. This animal refuses to be directed. The literally hard-necked animal refuses to be Directed, and that's how God sees Israel. You're stiff neck. And I think here might be one of those places where we can identify with Israel. Would you be willing to go down that road? Because this is how most humans are, truthfully. We, we, we resist authority, we want to do things our own way, we ignore the prodding of God. 
right? We hold off that nudge. We do not listen to the one who made us and the one for whom we have been made. Maybe it maybe goes without saying, but just in case, I'll say it anyway. It is sinful to resist authority when that authority is God-ordained. More so when that authority is God himself. That's why the psalmist implores us, today if you would hear his voice, today if you would hear his voice, if you hear God's voice, the psalmist is saying, do not harden your heart against him. Don't do what comes naturally. Don't, 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 don't harden your heart today if you hear his voice. Now when the people heard that God would not go with them, they began to to mourn. Somewhere, somehow, in a very short period of time, they have come to realize just how important it is to have God, the true God, in their lives. Just a few days prior, they, they thought they could live without him. They thought they could find a substitute for him. They thought any old God will do. Let's just take off our jewelry, throw it in the fire, bring something out, call it our God. That's all we need. That was their mindset just a few days before. But somehow, some way, through the judgment that God has placed on them, through the teaching and the preaching and the rebuke of Moses, I don't know, but somehow they've come to understand now. They need God. It is not a recommended strategy. But it does seem that sometimes we have to wander off in disobedience to sense the joys of true obedience. That sometimes we, we have to indulge in something that may be false or wrong to know for sure what is true and right. That we have to go far from home and far from where we truly belong in order to get to that point like the prodigal son who looks back and knows that's my home and that is where I belong. It seems like this is what's happened for Israel. They have, they have wandered and rebelled, but they are back and they know they have to have God in their life. The idea of no God in their life is unbearable. Because he is the one responsible for their freedom. He is the one who's gotten them this far on the journey. And they need him. And the idea that they would have to press on without him sends them into a state of great grief. Now, in response to God's declaration, Moses tells the people to remove their ornaments. Take off your jewelry. And why is that? Well, we know because we've been studying through the book of Exodus that just in the previous chapter... The people had used their jewelry to make an idol. And the, these gold ornaments are associated with idolatry. So by removing them, taking them off, Israel is renouncing its allegiance to idolatry and proclaiming its allegiance to God. It's divesting itself of the means of idolatry to say, whatever it takes now, we want to follow the living God. At the same time, Without ornaments, this nation is finally dressed humbly and properly for the mourning that they are experiencing. You dress up when you want to go out and celebrate, and you dress down or you dress humbly when you don't want to call attention to yourself. And that's what's happening here. It wasn't that long ago, you would remember, that the Israelites were dressed up, and then if you read between the lines, they became undressed for partying. And now they've come full circle adorned, as it were, for a funeral. Stripping off their jewelry is tantamount to clothing themselves in sackcloth and ashes. They are worried, and they ought to be worried. Will God really leave them? Will this be the end of the line for them as his people? Have they finally done it? Be cut off. Verse 5 leaves us with suspense. God says, take off your jewelry, the NIV translation. Take off your jewelry and I will decide what to do with you. That is much more serious than you wait until your father gets home. But it has a similar foreboding, doesn't it? 
There's a lot hanging in the balance here. What's going to happen? Now, the verses that come after this scene, verses 7 to 11, are the kind of verses that could throw a reader for a loop because they really seem out of place. In fact, this whole chapter feels a little bit disjointed. Some of you probably read ahead in preparation for today, and you're wondering, what is this thing telling us? The whole chapter feels a little disjointed as if it were pieced together somewhat randomly. It almost reads like three acts of a not-so-great play. But these verses are right where they belong. Because so far we've had a change of setting and a change of plans, and now we're on the verge of a change of relationship. While God decides what he's going to do with the Israelites, the writer of Exodus takes us on a stroll down memory lane. This section is in the past tense. Moses used to. It's what Moses used to do. It's been interpreted various ways through the years. But verses 7 to 11 seem best understood as a flashback to earlier times when Moses met with God and everyone saw it and everyone knew what was going on as God came to the tent of meeting that Moses had erected outside the camp and the pillar of the cloud, all Israel worshipped with him from their own tents. And they did this because they knew God was among them, right? This happened outside the camp in that former tent of meeting that was supposed to be replaced by the new tent of meeting, which was to be the new tabernacle, which was to be placed where? In the center of the camp. Because God is, through this narrative, moving closer and closer to his people. He has heard their cries. He has rescued them. He has accompanied them and led them in a pillar of cloud and fire by night. And now he wants to take up residence right in the middle of them. And he's prepared to do that. Till they worship a golden calf as their God. It reminds me of Jesus, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How oft I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks. But you would not. I move to you, but you move away. I'll come to be with you, but you're going to do that thing which cuts us off. These verses, these verses give us like a, 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 almost another creation fall scenario. God wants to dwell with his people. God Tells them what to do. So that can happen. And then they disobey. And their sin puts the two now on opposite sides. Right? These verses tell us that God used to speak to Moses as a friend. Now this is serious business because God has become their enemy. The relationship between God and Israel is in the balance and something has to be done. So Moses steps in like he always does to intercede on behalf of his people. He says to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you've not let me know whom you'll send with me. Moses is saying, you're not going, you're going to send an angel. You don't even tell me who the angel is. Who is this guy? What's his name? What can he do? I know that sounds silly, kind of silly, but imagine this. You're planning an awesome trip. You're going with somebody that you think the world of. At the last minute, that person says, oh, by the way, I'm not going, but don't worry, I'm going to send someone. Is that okay? Don't you at least want to know? Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then this is what Moses is saying. You, you haven't even told me who you're going to send with me. And yet you've said that you know me by name and that I have found favor in your sight. Is this how you treat someone who, who's found favor in your sight? Now, if I have found favor in your sight, he goes on, show me now your ways that I might know you in order to find favor in your sight, that I want this to keep going. I want to keep pleasing you. I want to, I want to keep knowing you. And then he says, consider, too, this nation is your people. Moses is saying, God, what can I do to please you? Show me what you want. Show me what, you, what your ways are. You know, if you and I truly want to serve God well, we've got to know his ways. We can't just go do our own thing and hope that that's God's way when he has shown us his ways in the word. If we want to serve him well, if we're serious about it, we've got to know his way. 
Show me your ways, that's the same desire expressed. You've read Psalm 119, right? Very long psalm. Over and again, show me your ways. Incline my heart to your testimonies, O God, and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. When this all started, you might remember at the burning bush, Moses was afraid and he hid his face from God. Look how Moses is growing. Now he wants to know God more and more. And how about you? How about you, beloved? Is that same desire in you? Do you want to know God more? I hope it is, because there's always a danger among us that we become satisfied with knowing enough. Maybe, maybe that's why the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesians, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Because when it comes to God, I think you would agree with this. There's always more to learn. There's always more to learn. He's so wonderful, so beautiful, so magnificent, so wise. There's always more to learn. And, and, and our pursuit of that more, that is whether or not we're trying to know God more, is diagnostic. If we're faithful in worship, if we're engaged in studies, if we're finding a small group, if we're attending Sunday school, if we're reading our Bible, that's diagnostic. We want to know God more. But if we have to be coerced into all these things, if we have to be forced into all of this stuff, if, if the books stay on the shelf and never get cracked, and we don't find ourselves even really praying or talking to the Lord, that tells us something too. It tells us, sadly, but true at times, maybe we think we know enough. Pastor and author Kevin DeYoung preached on this passage and said, if you've no interest in knowing the laws of God, you've no interest in knowing God. And if we're not passionate about getting into our Bibles, it's because, among other things, we're ultimately not that passionate about getting to know God. Moses was passionate about getting to know God. And we should be too. Show me your ways, he says, so I can know you. And notice that he tosses in that little reminder, right? Consider, too, that this nation is your people. These are not the people, God. This is your people. So Moses is saying to God, show me how to lead these people well, because they're your people. They deserve to be governed well. They should be guided well. And God responds to Moses' intercession by relenting. In verse 14, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now the dialogue continues almost as if Moses wasn't expecting that answer, or didn't quite hear it. He carries right on, but actually it wasn't what he was really shooting for. We're going to get to that in a second, but notice first before we do, God promises something that wasn't asked for. He promises to give Moses rest. And it's not so much that we can deduce from the text that Moses is exhausted or that he's tired necessarily. The question to ask of the text is, what has caused unrest? What has caused unrest in Moses' life or, or, or in the life of everyone in the camp? And it's this, that God has said he won't go with us. This is what has us all upset. But here he says that he will go. In addition, or perhaps simply by going, he's going to provide rest. Rest in the sense of being settled. Rest in the sense of having confidence to face the future is obtained through the presence of God with St. Augustine famously said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. It is the faithful presence of God that gives his created ones strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. It's knowing that God is with us that helps us to put one foot in front of the other and carry on. I think that's why Jesus' words continue to resonate through the, the community of the faithful, right? When he says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I am with you. I am 
with you. We serve a God who promises never to leave us and never to forsake us. And one finds rest in life by finding this God. If it's, if it's rest for your weary soul that you are here looking for today, then keep listening because there's a way to have it. There is a way to have it, and it involves surrendering your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because He is the peace that you need. And he is the peace that we all need. He is the way and the truth and the life. And to the, to the degree that we would be willing to orient our lives, not around ourselves and our own whims and our wants, but around Him, then all the discord, all the distortion, all the disorder, when we seek first His kingdom and rule, all these things come into place. They come into order. And they give us rest. Jesus, in fact, gives an invitation and and while giving that invitation, he may very well have had this scene from Israel's past in his mind. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Don't be stiff-necked. Take my yoke upon you. Submit yourself to my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle. It's going to destroy your life. I'm the one who's going to make it worth living. <laughs> I'm gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy. And my burden is is life. Moses presses on with God. What has been offered is good, but it's singular. God says to Moses, I'll go with you. And Moses is advocating not for himself, but for all of Israel. After God says he'll go with Moses and he'll give him rest, Moses says, but if you won't go with us, then don't bring us up from here. Because if you're not with us, how's anybody going to know that I found favor in your sight or your people have how will we be distinct from all the people in the world? Isn't it your presence with us that distinguishes us from everyone else? And yes, the presence of God is all Israel has going for it in the long run. It's all any of us have. They don't want to move without it. So God assures Moses, verse 17, this very thing that you've spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. This very thing that you have spoken, Moses, what you've come and asked for, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight. That's where we're going to leave off this morning. But just a couple observations that hopefully will help bring this thing home. By way of implication, because there's not really a lot of application to be found in this particular passage. First, let's note that what Israel's facing here is a dilemma of every human being. That Israel is a picture of the human condition. Because of their sin, the people cannot live with God. And at the same time, they cannot live without Him. How can a holy God live with a sinful people? There's a great breach that must be repaired. And to do that is going to require the work of a mediator. Moses is the mediator. He is an effective mediator. He is good at mediation. He's already convinced God not to destroy the Israelites because of their sin. Now he's asking God, please go back to the original plan. Guide your people out. Guide your people up. And come and live with us. Come down in glory and live in our midst. We know Moses is good because God says, yes. I will. And he said that he would do this because he had found favor. Moses had found favor in his sight. In other words, God is going to do this because he is pleased with, not Israel, but Israel's mediator. Commentator Phil Riken puts it this way, and I want to close with a few of his words. I'll sprinkle a few of mine in as well. 
The Israelites are saved by the merits of their mediator. God did this so we'd understand the true basis for our salvation. We cannot be saved by what we have done. No one can. We are too sinful to merit salvation. So how can we be saved? Our salvation depends on the pleasure God takes in our mediator. That is to say, our salvation rests on the delight that God takes in the person of his Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to continue while you let that sink in for a second. We'll come back to it. Reichen continues as well. Frankly, there are times when we wonder how God could ever be pleased with us. We get weighed down by our own sin. We feel like failures. We know that we don't even measure up to our own standards, let alone the standard, the perfect standard of God. Then we each ask, how could God ever be pleased with someone like me? Especially since I know that he is not pleased with my sin. The answer is that God is pleased with Jesus. Therefore, he is pleased with anyone who trusts in Jesus. The pleasure God takes in each of us is based on the pleasure that he takes in his own beloved son. This is the only basis on which God is pleased with anyone. And if you want God to be pleased with you from now until forever, ask Jesus to be your Savior. Jesus is the mediator. He does for us what Moses did for Israel, only he does it more perfectly. He prays for our salvation on the basis of his own standing before God. He asks God to accept us, not because we're acceptable, because we're not acceptable, but because he is. And Jesus says to his Father, if you are pleased with me, save my people. If you are pleased with me, if I have found favor in your sight, save my people. And we know that God is pleased with Jesus. He said as much. When Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus, the son of God, came to this earth in compassion, not to condemn it, but to save it. He humbled himself, we read in Philippians chapter 2, taking on the form of a man and of a servant at that. We further read that he humbled himself even to the point of death, death on a cross, though he did nothing to deserve it. And in dying, he took upon himself the sins of humanity and he bore punishment for those sins, the wrath of God, killed. He was buried, he was dead, but death could not hold him. He rose from the grave. The resurrection proves that God was pleased with the perfect life and the atoning death of Jesus for sinners. The Father is pleased with Jesus. And pleased to save everyone who trusts in him. He is pleased with us. He is pleased with us. Because he is pleased with you. Lord, you are gracious and merciful beyond anything we deserve. Thank you for loving us and pursuing us, saving us. We do struggle at times to wonder if you are pleased with us, believing that you could be. The depth of this message thinking to us today. We might not continue to strive under that heavy yoke of trying to earn your approval. Be good enough but that we instead might know for sure the rest that comes. God, that you are pleased with us because you are pleased with us. Amen.
Amen. We would normally sing a concluding song, but without an accompanist, you are free to go. Instead, I know.